My name is uh, Pietro Asinari, and uh, I'm the scientific director of uh, INRIM, uh, who is the research center devoted to uh, met metrology research, and is also the National Metrology Institute uh, with the, the responsibility to take care of all the uh, referencing measurements uh, in, in the country. So today we are here to uh, present you some uh, topics uh, among those who can select uh, for the PhD program in metrology. That is a joint uh, initiative with Politecnico di Torino. And uh, today uh, you will have the opportunity to, to go a little bit more in deep into some of the topics that you can choose among uh, in this uh, sort of options that you have when you subscribe to this PhD program. And it's also an opportunity to uh, understand a little bit more about the PhD program in metrology, because uh, it's a pretty unique uh, kind of opportunity in the country. And that's another good point, uh, because there will be less competition once you finish and you will graduate, you will have less competitors in searching for, for the job in the market. So essentially, uh, metrology is, of course, the science of measurement. But a PhD program in metrology is a PhD program designed to push forward the boundaries of the measurement sciences. So the idea is to develop better measurement chains or better instruments for doing better measurements. And the, 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 the path uh, in terms of educational path and also research activity path is exactly intended to, to give you the tools for, for achieving this sort of expertise, right? So uh, I don't want to, to take much of your time. I will just, uh, um, in the introduction, explain you how it works. Unfortunately, I will not be able to stay with you all the time because I have other duties for the Institute, but I will soon uh, leave the virtual stage to uh, my colleague, Oriano Bottauscio, who is in charge of the PhD program in metrology for the Institute. And he will present you what is the, let's say, uh, common framework of the PhD program to, to give you a sort of flavor of how it works. And then there will be a sequence of colleagues presenting specific topics. And we hope that uh, at least uh, some of them will trigger your curiosity and will uh, let you maybe contact even the speaker that can provide you even further more uh, details about these kind of topics. And of course, I thank you very much for, for joining this event today and for showing already in this way your interest with regards to our institute. So thank you very much. And uh, I leave the stage to uh, Oriano. Thank you, Pietro. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, I will briefly present uh, the PhD in metrology. I am Oriano Bottoluccio, the uh, deputy coordinator of this uh, PhD program. I have uh, very few slides just to introduce to you this uh, type of uh, um, training course. Okay, can you see my, my screen? Yeah, it works. Okay, so uh, some words have been already um, given by, by Pietro. The PhD in Metrology is a PhD program organizing convention between uh, our institute uh, and the uh, Politecnico di Torino. Uh, I just want to, to say that uh, the, uh, all the um, administrative parts are uh, in charge of Polito, but all scientific aspects are handled in cooperation by the two institutions. In particular, hearing researchers are um, strongly involved in this, uh, in this PhD program because are part of uh, the Board of Professors. They offer several research topics uh, along the year. We will see some examples today. Uh, play the role of tutors and also keep courses uh, uh, on uh, specific subjects. Uh, this is an ex a unique example of PhD uh, in Italy. Uh, it is a training program in measurement science and metrology that has uh, been uh, built uh, as a consequence of the historical cooperation between uh, IRIM and Polito. Uh, there are similar examples in other countries in Europe, uh, even if not all these uh, uh, training program provide at the end a PhD degree. So there are also other type of uh, training uh, initiatives. Uh, we can identify in this uh, PhD program uh, two main fields. Uh, one that is devoted to the fundamental metrology. Uh, typical example is the implementation of the new SI, but there are also other activities related to these uh, aspects and a second uh, framework that is more related to the applied metrology. So 
dealing with the topics related to energy, environment, health, space and foods activities. I just want to stress the fact that uh, the, uh, this, this uh, PhD in metrology has an interdisciplinary character. Uh, this means that it is open to a vast uh, pool of skills. I reported here just some, some examples. We have uh, um, students coming from engineering and physics, but also chemistry, biotechnology, and applied maths. So uh, different skills are uh, useful for doing activities in this type, in this field. Uh, the admission, some details about the admission. Uh, the admission is uh, uh, usually divided into three separate sessions along the year. Uh, I have reported here which are the deadlines for the application this year. Uh, as you can see, the first session has been already uh, closed, but uh, we are now entering into the second session when, where the deadline will be the 1st of June. And then there will be a third session uh, in September. Uh, the selection of the application is uh, done essentially on three elements. Uh, you, the, the applicants must provide uh, some sort of CV with the qualifications. There will be a statement of purpose in which the applicant uh, um, express the, the research interest and the motivations and then an interview. Uh, it is important to say that there are two types of uh, PhD positions. This is also uh, mentioned in the, um, in the call. Uh, there are positions that are defined with uh, how with, with how research topics, uh, that means that the research topics is not defined a priori, but it is established after the applicant has uh, win the position. And the second uh, type is uh, a position with a predefinite research topic. So this means that in that in this case, the applicants know at the beginning which are the topics of the research that are um, put in competition, and so they apply for a specific research subject. Um, just to give you an example, in the first session that we uh, have uh, had in, uh, in spring, at the beginning of spring, we had a tier in two position for, uh, uh, with the perfined research topic. Uh, in the session that uh, will start uh, um, practically in a uh, in few, in few days, uh, the positions that are available at hearing are one position with the own research topic, so without having defined a priori the, the, the subject of the activity, and one position with predefined research topic. Uh, there could be, it is possible that other positions will be made available in the second session or, or in the third session. So, Please stay tuned, uh, check the, the, the website in order to see if other positions will be available in the next uh, weeks. Um, considering the uh, PhD position uh, with uh, a research topic, uh, if you want to have a general overview of the activities that are available at IRIM and that are offered to uh, the students, you can visit this uh, website, the, the website of the um, Polytechnic School of, uh, of, PhD, of PhD. You can find here different uh, research topics that provide to you a general overview of the activities that are uh, usually offered to students. You can uh, scroll among these um, projects, these activities, and if you are interested, you can contact the, the person that are uh, mentioned in each of these uh, um, topics uh, listed in this website. Uh, for the, um, this uh, second session, we have also one position available with predefined research topic, and this is what today will be presented by my colleagues. In particular, we have a position uh, that includes 10 research topics. Uh, the title are, are listed here, and today uh, the proponent, my colleagues, will give you a very rapid presentation of these activities. So if you are interested in one of these topics, you can apply for this and uh, also asking much more information to the proponent. 
So I'm finished here. Uh, I will suggest now to move to the presentation. We will have uh, two uh, blocks of presentation, uh, five presentation, uh, one uh, after each other. Then we will have a stop in which uh, uh, we will, uh, let me say, present the experience <laughs> done by students that uh, have followed this PhD program in the previous year. And then we will move to the other five presentation. So I will uh, stop uh, here. Okay, thank you, Oriano. Um, okay, I will start from the, the uh, new definition of the international system of units. Uh, uh, the most relevant, uh, which occurred uh, three, three years ago, <laughs> almost exactly, the most relevant uh, novelty of this uh, new system is the redefinition of the kilogram. The kilogram used to be defined as the mass of uh, one piece of meat, metal preserved in uh, Paris, if you, as you know for sure. And now uh, it's changed, uh, fortunately. The, the main consequence of, of uh, having that uh, definition is the fact that if you look at this, uh, at this graph, uh, we have uh, an uncertainty of all the mass measurement which is increasing um, the more when you go far apart from the uh, one kilogram mass. That is, if you uh, weight one kilogram, you have an uncertainty of part to, uh, uh, 10 to minus eight. But if you go in the region of uh, one gram or one, one milligram, uh, the uncertainty increase uh, dramatically. Uh, this is uh, um, a problem because Small mass measurements are very important in many, in many fields. So for this uh, now, uh, thanks to the new definition, we can realize the mass measurement through uh, electrical measurements. In, in, indeed, most of the main uh, metrological institute in the world has uh, built their own uh, balance, which are uh, elect electromagnetic balances. Uh, they are called watt balance or keyboard balance, and they are based on the, uh, my, uh, the, the force accepted by a uh, magnetic field in a, a wire where uh, current is flowing. But not only the magnetic, uh, the, the electromagnetic force exists, uh, but we can also exploit uh, electrostatic force, which is uh, in fact much uh, weaker than the electromagnetic one. So. Electro uh, electrostatic uh, force is not suitable for uh, large masses like one kilogram or more, but is uh, suitable for measuring masses like one gram or less. For this reason, we decided to go into the, this direction. Indeed, indeed uh, electrostatic balance was uh, the one who allowed uh, to make the, the first discoveries uh, of um, the electrical uh, phenomena, um, where they, uh, the, the scientists compared the, for, the um, mechanical forces with electrical forces. The basic equation uh, is this one where you have the mechanical force of uh, a mass uh, immersed in a gravitational field, which is compared, is equal to uh, a force which comes from the a voltage applied to a capacitor. So all the balances work on this, electrostatic balances work on this principle. At INRIM, we have uh, invented uh, um, a novel principle based on this, uh, on this, princi on this uh, phenomenon. And we have built uh, our own uh, prototype to demonstrate the principle. We obtained the first results and uh, the results were very promising. On the basis of, of these results, uh, INRIM decided to fund uh, the re realization of a uh, electrostatic balance, which will be used, used uh, by INRIM as a, a, a novel um, standard for mass measurement. Uh, okay, this is uh, the, uh, my proposal. So my proposal to the PhD student is to um, start working in this, um, let's say, contest where we want to compete with all the rest of the, the world in this field. And, uh, starting from the very beginning, because the, the project starts uh, right now, 
uh, it is foreseen that it will be it will last uh, about two years so we will have uh, an year more to uh, make comparison and to exploit the result so this is uh, in a very short my presentation and for details on uh, on what uh, i expect from the phd student or details on the working principle of the of the instrument uh, please contact me uh, at this address thank you for your attention thank you marco also for being in the, in the, in the time um, we, i will move to now to alessandro germac for uh, his presentation. So I would like to introduce uh, this uh, research activity in the field of uh, absolute uh, gravity measurement uh, that uh, is uh, carried out in INRIM by a research group. Um, why we need to measure the earth gravity? If we, there are several fields in which uh, uh, had, uh, uh, the gravity measurements are necessary for, for instance, for uh, oil and gas prospecting, for environmental monitoring, for the high speed train uh, construction, for the security and defense, uh, volcano mo monitoring, uh, sinkhole detecting, and also for the new SI, uh, my colleague uh, uh, Marco just before uh explain you about the uh, new uh, definition of mass and as uh, is uh, uh, clear from his presentation the uh, the balance uh, the experiments the balance uh, uh, generate the force so to derive the mass from the force uh, the, uh, is the the gravity value should be measured and the uncertainty of the mass realized with the new definition is, uh, of course, bigger than the uncertainty that is possible to obtain in the measurement of the gravity acceleration. So is uh, very uh, critical also for the uh, application for the new SI. Uh, we measure the absolute gravity measurement with uh, ballistic gravimeters that uh, realize the free fall and uh, detecting the rise and fall. In our case, this is the unique uh, gravimeter that use the symmetric uh, fall. So uh, analyzing the rise and fall trajectory, we can uh, uh, measure the gravity acceleration. The, um, the level of uncertainty that uh, we can reach with our instrument that uh, has been developed in our institute is at the order of uh, 10 to minus 9. So this is the uh, uncertainty required for the highest uh, applications. We um, have uh, a continuous uh, uh, modify and uh, improve our instruments. For instance, uh, we have now improving the uh, actual uh, uh, passive vibration isolation system, passing through a combined passive and active vibration isolation system. Also, uh, we are uh, changing the uh, system to launch the uh, the mass of the in the in the in the gravimeter that is one of uh, our larger contribution of the uncertainty the quality of the launch so you can see here the uh, the budget of uncertainty so the influence parameters that at the level of 10 to minus 9 are relevant to uh, to consider the uh, all effects that influence the uncertainty so in, for uh, each of these uh, uh, influence parameter, we are uh, doing several research in order to improve our instruments. Uh, on the other end, for other uh, methodological activities, the level of uncertainty is not so high. In this case, uh, is 10 to minus 5. But there are many practical uh, applications and there are no other type of instrument that can provide 
the measurement at this uh, uh, not so high level of the uncertainty. So this is another field that we want to investigate in order to develop a new instrument to, uh, to satisfy such a request. And uh, our activity now is uh, uh, in, involved in a, a national research uh, program that uh, is uh, related to establishing the absolute gravity and physical height system in Italy that will be linked with the international reference uh, network in the field of gravity. So we have to provide the traceability of the all measurement that will be performed in, in Italy. That is uh, the, the requirement in order to uh, put the Italian uh, point of the net in the international uh, networks. So this is the uh, overview of our activity in which the uh, PhD will uh, uh, develop his uh, research. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Alessandro. The questions will be given at the end of the event. So we can move to the next presentation. Uh, Marco Genovese. OK. So our proposal is just to work in the quantum optics research program. This research program, which was established more than 20 years ago, is aimed to study quantum technologies and quantum optics in particular. We are studying the possibility of overcoming the limits of classical measurements by exploiting quantum resource. And we wanted to create a metrological tools useful for the development of quantum technologies. There are different areas where the PhD can be performed. The first is quantum imaging. Here, the idea is to uh, exploit the quantum properties of light, for example, entanglement for uh, going beyond the limits of classical optics. In the past, we have realized the subshot noise imaging, and now we are realizing the subshot noise microscope. We have made the first realization of quantum illumination, namely the possibility to detect an object with performances uh, above what is possible with classical light. We've started quantum interferometry, ghost imaging, calibration of detectors, and so on. All these activities are running, and so can be uh, argument of a thesis. Another field is uh, the quantum sensing protocol. In particular, we are exploiting the properties of color centers in diamond and uh, the peculiar level structure of these uh, defects that can be used for making uh, nanoscale measurements of temperature, electromagnetic fields, electrical fields, and so on. Recently, we have measured the effect of the transmission of the action potential in neurons by making a localized temperature measurement inside the cell. And again, this can be another uh, field where uh, the, the PhD can work. Further studies concern a new paradigm of measurement in quantum mechanics, namely the possibility to realize a new kind of measurements that uh, can then be applied to the development of new meteorological tools like the weak measurements, the protective measurements uh, that uh, uh, are uh, studied in optics, in quantum optics in our lab. Finally, we are developing metrology for quantum technologies, such as characterization of photon detectors, single photon sources, and so on. This is inside the, the uh, the metrological network that is developing about quantum technologies. And again, this can be one possible work for PhD students. Of course, if you have uh, any question or you are interested, please contact me and uh, I will provide uh, more information. Thank you. Thank you, Marco. Uh, we can move now to Leonardo Mortati. Leonardo, are you ready? Okay, you can uh, share your screen. Uh, thank you to all. I will present this topic. Uh, it's um, basically a measurement of microplastic and environmental sample through advanced and standard optical and microscopy techniques. As uh, we all know, 
The plastics are um, everywhere in the world, mostly in the ocean, and these microplastics will uh, enter in the food chain and then uh, uh, we could uh, um, eat microplastics. So it's really important to have a, a standardization of the measurement of the microplastics. So we started also to study the effect of microplastics in living cells with this uh, nonlinear optical microscopy. So with CARS, that is a, a clearing program and uh, microscopy, we saw the uh, uptake of microplastic in the human uh, cells. And uh, so we started already this uh, kind of study, but also we uh, participate in a European um, metrological project uh, where we have to characterize the microplastic in terms of uh, quantification, size distribution, and identification. So the name of, of the project is Plastic Trace, and uh, we, we work uh, with the two techniques, basically a standard technique, so it is phase contrast microscopy, to quantify microplastics and determine their size distribution. And uh, also advanced the microscopy, such as CARS and simulator and scattering, where we can characterize microplastic, um, also um, identifying them. <coughs> so the, the candidate will develop and implement a specific image processing technique to identify automatically the microplastics and the extra other relevant parameters. So for example, with uh, a standard phase contrast optical microscopy, we have uh, the image, and then this image uh, should be processed in order to extract the, the number and the, the geometrical signatures of the microplastics. So, um, and the, in the other case, we will have an hyperspectral image, so we should perform some uh, um, clustering analysis in order to extract the, the chemical uh, signature of the microplastics. So if you are interested, uh, please contact me. I'm, uh, my contact address is here. And if you have, have any question, please uh, don't worry, I will uh, reply that. So thank you. Thank you, Leonardo. Now we can go the, to Andrea Sosso. Okay, this is a presentation about the proposal for the Quantum Vault uh, PhD. And uh, I'm Andrea Sos, I'm working with the Quantum Vault standard. And uh, this is a, sh a short overview of what the topics uh, uh, that a PhD candidate will be involved. So one, one point is uh, what is uh, voltage? We are dealing with quantities, in particular uh, electrical quantities. Uh, basically, the electrical quantities are voltage and current, so that means that uh, you can uh, uh, fully understand and fully describe the physical properties of any physical circuit using the current and, and uh, the voltage. That gives you a complete uh, uh, physical uh, description of uh, any, any circuit you can you can. You can make uh, whatever complex the circuit is. The volt is uh, uh, the most common and convenient uh, uh, quantity that we have uh, for describing uh, electrical phenomena. And the volt is the unit for the electrical uh, uh, potential. We are working with standards. We are working with the units uh, for, for the volt. And that means that we have to provide a reliable reference value uh, for, for instance, for calibrating instruments. Uh, the volt is currently maintained using, using a, um, a quantum standard, which is based on the Johnston effect. That means that we had, uh, have a significant and uh, uh, really huge improvement with respect to the old standards we had in the, in the old days. Uh, basically, this is a quantum phenomenon, so we have uh, uh, fundamental principles that are involved, but the, the, the real important thing is that we have uh, uh, a definition of the volt, we can measure the volt in terms of uh, uh, the uh, uh, con um, fundamental of co uh, constants of physics that are the uh, 
uh, electron uh, charge and the uh, Planck constants. You can see the relation at the bottom uh, of the slide. Uh, okay. Uh, the, the Josephson effect is realized using uh, many, many, many junctions to, to have um, a practical voltage. That means that uh, uh, we have a device that very complex and, and, and uh, difficult to realize. Using the device, uh, we can, uh, uh, we can uh, make uh, different standards. Uh, one is programmable voltage standards. They are realized using uh, techniques similar to an, um, digital to analog converter in electronics. So we can switch uh, uh, as many junctions and we, as, as, as we need. And by switching junctions, we can uh, provide uh, a changing uh, uh, output voltage. So we can generate sideways or any, any, any kind of uh, 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 profile uh, and variation in uh, in time of the of the voltage. Uh, we have done uh, several research on binary coding, uh, fast switching of bias signals, uh, uh, special modulation techniques, uh, and uh, uh, some specialized electronics for programmable standards. Uh, another technique is based on pulsed standards. This uh, is very useful to increase the speed of the of the signals involved. This is uh, still a, a, a very active uh, research field, and this is another uh, kind of standards we are actively developing. We are using uh, this for for mass signals uh, and. Uh, uh, studying uh, high high speed uh, pulse uh, pulses to provide higher voltage, and uh, more recently to, we are dealing with uh, 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 optical optical bias uh, of the standards. We are working with uh, cryo coolers. This is a very uh, important improvement over the old techniques that uh, were based on the on the on liquid helium. So this is uh, a short overview of uh, what kind of topics uh, the uh, PhD student uh, uh, will be uh, involved. That uh, uh, is, is supposed to be a, a activity with uh, strong involvement in uh, in a laboratory. It's a multidisciplinary approach that involves many many fields of uh, uh, physical knowledge. So it's uh, it's very open and stimulating. If you are interested, uh, please uh, contact me for any questions and and um, anything you need. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Andrea. So uh, you can stop sharing. Uh, we have uh, finished the first block of presentation. So now we have uh, um, three videos with uh, some experience that have been done by students that have already finished their PhD courses. Uh, I ask Silvia to uh, start this video. Hi everybody, I am Palmasara Letizia and I am a power electronic engineer. I received a master degree from University of Campania Luigi Van Vitelli and then I started the PhD at Politecnico di Torino and IRIM. I uh, finished the PhD a few months ago and now I'm still here at IRIM working as a research uh, fellow. I decided to do the PhD because I always wanted to be a researcher and the PhD degree is uh, the first important step to reach this goal. In particular, I chose the uh, PhD program in metrology because according, according to me, the metrology is one of the most complete science and can be applied to all the science field. As Lord Kelvin said, to measure is to know. To know. During the PhD, 
I had the opportunity um, of work in this amazing high voltage laboratory and this is because my uh, PhD thesis was focused on power grid. Power grids are experiencing a great revolution and this is because two main reasons. The first reason is the increase of uh, distributed energy, source, uh, energy systems based on uh, renewable energy sources and the second reason is uh, the um, introduction of uh, digi di digital electrical substation. In particular, with my PhD activity, we uh, have uh, developed a new measurement uh, setup and uh, procedure for the uh, characterization of new generation of voltage and current sensors under conditions that are um, representative of the real one. Uh, during the PhD, I received a lot of support uh, from my supervisor, and, uh, which made me feel uh, immediately part of the research team. I had the opportunity uh, to learn many things, to work with uh, very skilled researchers and scientists from MIRIM, from, from modern national metrology institutes, and from university. And uh, this is because the activities that I carried out during the PhD were inserted in the framework of two important important European projects, which are uh, Future Grid 2 and uh, IT4PQ. I really suggest uh, the PhD because it represents a great opportunity to increase the knowledge and to be prepared for whatever you want to do after the PhD, that uh, in my case was uh, uh, research. Buongiorno a tutti, sono Filippo Bregolin e sono un ex dottorando dell'Istituto Nazionale di Ricerca Meteorologica di Torino e sono qua per raccontarvi un po' qual è stata la mia esperienza di dottorato e quali sono le opportunità che un'esperienza di questo genere può aprire. Innanzitutto, brevemente, il mio percorso di studi, io mi sono laureato a Torino, all'Università di Torino, in Fisica delle Tecnologie Avanzate e quindi mi, poi uni mi sono unito al gruppo di Metrologia di Tempo e Frequenza all'INRIM per il dottorato. Dopo un anno di postdoc, adesso mi trovo in Germania, a Monaco, a lavorare nel reparto di ricerca e sviluppo di un'azienda che si occupa di sistemi laser per la scienza, per la ricerca scientifica. Questa azienda si chiama Toptica Photonics. Perché se il dottorato in metrologia è stato importante? È un'esperienza molto bella dal mio punto di vista. Innanzitutto vi parlo di quella che è stata la mia esperienza nel gruppo di metrologia di frequenza. Noi ci occupiamo di sviluppare gli orologi atomici. E gli orologi atomici sono basati sull'interazione tra i laser e gli atomi. Quindi si tratta di fisica atomica, fisica dei laser. E questa fisica è estremamente interessante. Noi con i laser, nel visibile, andiamo a manipolare la struttura interna degli atomi stessi per andare per esempio ad intrappolarli, a raffreddarli, a, a farci delle cose. Eh, L'obiettivo era appunto realizzare degli orologi atomici ma la scienza, la fisica che ci sta dietro è la stessa che, può, che permette poi di, adesso di sviluppare quelli che sono i computer quantistici basati sugli atomi neutri o sugli atomi agli ioni e anche sistemi di, di sensing quantistico come ad esempio i gravimetri quantistici o cose di questo genere. Non è stato interessante il dottorato soltanto per, per la fisica ma anche per la metrologia la metrologia è la scienza della misura, come fare le misure. E spesso e volentieri non viene data abbastanza importanza al fatto che eh, è sì interessante studiare dei, dei parametri fisici inter speciali o che ti permettono di, di realizzare degli orologi atomici, ma allo stesso tempo bisogna sapere come fare le misure, come ottenere i risultati. E questo è quello che viene insegnato nel, anche nel dottorato di metrologia, nel, nel, per quello che, per quanto concerne proprio la metrologia stessa. Per, infine, eh, grazie al, al dottorato in metrologia, io mi, ho anche avuto l'opportunità di fare un'esperienza all'estero estremamente arricchente, nel mio caso sono stato nove mesi in Giappone, a Riken, ma ad esempio molti miei colleghi sono stati negli Stati Uniti al NIST, oltre ai tanti istituti in cui si può andare per fare un'esperienza all'estero, e questo fa parte anche del dottorato. Eh, il dottorato in metrologia mi ha aperto sicuramente anche delle opportunità interessanti a livello lavorativo, non soltanto in ambito accademico, perché infatti io ho scelto di continuare in, nell'industria, questa è una scelta mia in base a quello che, che desideravo fare io, 
e ho avuto opportunità l'opportunità di, di, di essere assunti in questa azienda a Monaco che si occupa di laser altamente, a, cioè di, di altissimo livello, usati per, per gli esperimenti scientifici in tutto il mondo. E chiaramente aziende di questo cer- di tipo cercano eh, persone con un dottorato alle spalle che abbiano acquisito esperienza nell'ambito della fotonica, della fisica atomica, della fisica dei laser. E, e quindi avere un percorso di dottorato di questo genere mi ha davvero permesso di essere, di, di essere assunto e poter eh, parte, eh, far parte di un'azienda di questo genere. Spero quindi che eh, anche voi potrete essere interessati a questo genere di cose, se eh, eh, volete saperne di più della mia esperienza potete contattarmi, eh, questo, il mio indirizzo è eh, email è questo qua e vi lascio al resto della, della giornata di presentazione. Un saluto a tutti, ciao! My name is Giuseppe Cavoto, I'm 37 years old and I've been working here at Ethereum in Turin uh, for six years. In fact, I started here my PhD in metrology uh, in 2016 and after obtaining it I had the opportunity to continue my research project uh, in the laboratory dealing with the thermodynamic pro- um, properties of uh, several fluid. Uh, talking about how I got here, uh, my career uh, has been a little bit unconventional and out of the norm In fact, after obtaining my master's degrees uh, in physics at the University of Turin uh, in 2011, I suddenly uh, ran away from my studies uh, looking for a job. And, but after six years of working as an IT developer software, Uh, I figured out that I was missing uh, two of my favorite passions, which are uh, science and technology, in uh, particular applied technology. So I took a, de- a decision which is quite out of the norm. So I quit my job and applied uh, for a PhD scholarship at the Doctoral Poly- um, Politecnico School of Turin. I chose the PhD in metrology because uh, the subject uh, offered um, looked l- uh, like it was very interesting and uh, r- strongly related to some of the most important issues, in my opinion, in this uh, last decade, which is energy production and energy distribution. In fact, Uh, the topic of my research program was, the, uh, was to measure um, thermodynamic properties of different natural gas such as uh, methane and other hydrocarbons. And in particular, uh, I had to measure speed of sound in uh, liquid methane at cryogenic pr- uh, temperature and high pressure. And so, as you can imagine, uh, the nature itself of this particular kind of measurement don't allow to use uh, commercial available instruments and uh, software. So, uh, in my opinion, the most important aspect of my research project was to Uh, develop, design and test uh, from the very beginning an entire experimental apparatus. First time that the ultrasonic sensor that uh, I designed uh, worked properly, it was I think uh, one of the best memory in my mind and I think that uh, I will never forget about it. Uh, in conclusion, if you are an enterprising person and uh, you are willing to start a research uh, career uh, in a positive environment both professionally and uh, personally, working on topics strictly related to uh, technologies and innovation, I strongly recommend you to choose a metrology PhD as uh, a good choice for your future. And uh, moreover, based on my own experience, uh, i would strongly recommend uh, this choice um, even if uh, you graduated several years ago 
And this is simply because uh, it is never too late to follow your passions. We move with the other presentation, the other blocks of five presentation. So, Filippo, are you ready, Filippo Levi? Are you ready for presenting your uh, yes? Topic? Okay, please. Okay. Okay, so I will uh, describe our uh, research proposal that is a transportable with terbium optical clock. You can see here my address and the website of our group where you can find uh, more information of, on our activities. So why optical clocks? Uh, uh, in this picture, you can see the uh, stability performance, the accuracy performance of uh, um, various type of clocks in the past uh, 50 years. And you can see uh, in blue the cesium uh, accuracy that uh, since the redefinition of the second uh, uh, proven by almost uh, uh, one order of magnitude per decade up to reaching 10 to minus 16 accuracy. And uh, with the uh, dots, you can see the optical clock. Uh, the red dot represents the measurement uh, against cesium. So clearly, the, those are limited by the cesium uh, fountain accuracy. While in green, you can see the uh, stated accuracy of the optical clock. Uh, you can immediately see that uh, since uh, the last uh, 10, uh, 12 years, uh, optical clock have been improved the accuracy beyond the, uh, uh, what is measurable with cesium. And so it means that uh, time is ready for a, a redefinition of the second and to establish optical clock as, pri as a new primary frequency standard. Uh, you can see that- uh, Sorry, Filippo, we are yes. continue to see the first slide. Yes, yes, I know, I, I have okay. not moved yet. Okay, we can okay. still see the first slide that I have put two lines. One is a satellite link and the other one is optical fiber link. These are the two uh, main uh, comparison uh, technique that we have uh, right now. And uh, satellite link uh, are well suited for uh, comparing uh, uh, cesium uh, clocks, but uh, uh, they cannot uh, stand the accuracy of optical clock uh, because uh, the, the accuracy of optical clock is lower than, uh, than the satellite link. So, uh, what is another technique? Excuse, excuse me, I, 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 can see, I can see the graph. I still see the first page of your presentation. The first page, oh, this is a... It's portable, I, I see the title page. Now you can see the second slide. Okay, now yes, okay. okay, fine. Sorry. Okay, so very, <laughs> I repeat very briefly what I was saying. Uh, you can see in this picture, we have a cesium clock accuracy in blue that uh, is now reached 10 to minus 16 and is difficult that will improve further. In red dot are optical clock measurement. You can see in uh, uh, red, uh, the dot are optical clock measurement. You can see the uh, comparison against cesium and the real accuracy of optical clock that is uh, by a couple of order of magnitude already uh, surpassing the accuracy of cesium clock. Satellite link, if you want to compare different clock in different laboratories, you can use either satellite link that are able to compare clock on a worldwide intercontinental comparison, but these are really limited to 10 to minus 16 level that are suited for cesium, but not for optical clock. Optical fiber link instead are quite a good way to compare clock at 10 to minus 18 accuracy level but uh, uh, it's difficult to run uh, optical uh, fiber link uh, uh, on an intercontinental basis. You can, uh, we have uh, in Europe, we have developed uh, uh, the most advanced uh, uh, fiber link network in the world that is connecting uh, NPL, PTB, CIRTA and INDRIM, and we can compare optical clock, but uh, uh, when we come to uh, international co intercontinental comparison, this system of comparison is not uh, uh, suitable. Uh, so uh, this is one of the first reasons why we need optical clocks. So in, in order to be able to compare uh, very distant clock and also to perform other uh, uh, type of uh, physical experiment. Now optical clock are kind of uh, lab size experiment. Uh, very far away from uh, a typical commercial uh, atomic clock that you can find in the microwave. Uh, this is a picture of our iterbium clock. And uh, uh, transportable clock also uh, 
can be used for running uh, other type of uh, experiment like uh, uh, a collaboration between INDRIM, PTB and NPL performed the first proof of principle uh, uh, test of generalistic of geodesy, relativity geodesy with optical clock. Uh, by running a transportable optical clock from uh, uh, first in a tunnel in the mountain between Italy and France, and then uh, bringing it to Torino and comparing the frequency difference with the optical fiber link between the two measurements. And this is a, a, a proof of the ge uh, general relativity principle that uh, clocks uh, near the ground of the Earth uh, uh, tick slower with respect to the clock in it with a given altitude. But uh, uh, still, uh, this transportable clock, that for sure was uh, an important uh, uh, breakthrough, uh, is uh, more like a transportable lab than a real transportable clock. You can see this is the picture of a clock that was developed by uh, PTB, and it's a, a, a big trailer with a lot of uh, uh, ordinary laboratory equipment inside, and not all, all the equipment can stay inside, some part has to be mounted even outside of this, uh, of this trailer. So uh, the idea uh, is to uh, bring a, a transportable optical clocks to a new mature level of technology, and uh, uh, for those reasons, first of all, uh, transportable clock, uh, it's a, a first step toward the realization of uh, a generally speaking commercial optical clock so that can be run uh, uh, not amended essentially with, or with a minimum uh, uh, human maintenance. Uh, it uh, represents an unavoidable technological step toward a global take up of uh, the optical clock technology in view of redefinition of the second. And uh, uh, new uh, scientific and technological uh, landscape are open uh, when increasing the uh, accuracy uh, of the clock by two order of magnitude and making this uh, type of instrument available uh, on a, a kind of commercial basis and uh, not only as, a, as an important laboratory experiment. And then uh, the redefinition of the second need also uh, the use of uh, commercial optical clock, the development and the use of commercial optical clock for all other activity related to timekeeping. Uh, uh, the PhD objective, uh, clearly the full development of a transportable optical clock uh, lays beyond what can be done by a PhD student in a free year of research. But uh, uh, during this uh, period of research, uh, we want to address uh, several critical technology uh, that are very important for the development of uh, 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 robust uh, optical clock. First of all, uh, we have to deal with overall design of the uh, design of the Iterbium optical clock. Then uh, we, there is a, a development of ultra low noise transportable laser for uh, uh, making the atomic interrogation and the development of a transportable uh, reference cavity. So this is a, a part that is related to uh, the optical laser of the system. And then uh, we have to test this uh, uh, rigid and transportable system on uh, our already existing interview clock. Uh, this project uh, is, uh, all, is done also in collaboration uh, with, uh, uh, will be funded by uh, the Italian Space Agency that uh, has uh, uh, opened a, a, a research uh, uh, grant on this activity. And uh, we will work uh, uh, with uh, also uh, Leonardo Film Mechanica, that is uh, uh, one of the most uh, important high-tech uh, uh, industry in Italy that uh, and we will be partner in the development of uh, uh, the full uh, system optical, the full uh, transportable uh, uh, clock system. So thank you very much. Thank and, you. Uh, thank you, Filippo. Uh, so I will now okay. stop my share, screen so sharing. I invite Luca Alberto to start his presentation. Yes, can you hear me? Yeah, perfectly. Okay, uh, my name is Luca Alberto, and the um, uh, title of this uh, PhD proposal is a characterization system for microwave quantum devices. So the, the research title, the full research title is quite long, but the, the meaning is, is what I have already told you. So the characterization and realization and characterization of a measurement system 
uh, at microwaves for quantum devices. Um, the in-ring supervisor will be me, Luca Alberto. You can see here my, my email uh, address. And who we are, we are the Superconductive Quantum Electronics Group at INGRIM inside the Quantum Metrology and Nanotechnology Division. We have a small website, which is this one that you, you can visit to, to have more information about our activities. But uh, being short, what, what we are doing, we are working on quantum technologies. And in particular, many, many devices uh, employed in quantum technologies really, um, works with microwaves, needs microwave signals. So the ability of, of uh, generation, uh, measurement uh, and characterization of signal and devices at, at microwaves is a key uh, ability that we need to, to develop to be able to fully exploit the possibility of quantum technologies. Um, application of quantum technology for technologies, for example, are quantum computation and communication, radio astronomy, biomedical imaging, radio detection and ranging. So there are many, many applications. And all of them set new stringent demands of, on, on, on the measurements that we uh, should be able to do on these signals and on these devices. Uh, therefore, the measurement calibration uh, and measurement capabilities at microwaves uh, are very, very important. The problem is that we are um, able to, to do very good measurements at room temperature, but these, these techniques are, are uh, completely use, uh, useless at, uh, at cryogenic temperature. And uh, uh, all these quantum devices work in, in cryogenic environment. And so we need to, in some way, solve this problem. That means transfer the, the technology that we have to, to make good measurements at microwaves at room temperature to uh, cryogenic temperatures. OK, so uh, the proposed activity consists, in, 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 consists of the design and setup and characterization of a, uh, of a measurement system for scattering parameters. Uh, at microwaves at cryogenic temperatures. It will be based on a vector network, vector network analyzer technology, which is the technology that we uh, routinely use at room temperature. Here you can see a simple uh, schematic of the um, measurement setup that you would like, we would like to, to realize that you, you have the vector network analyzer at room temperature, then, then you have coaxial lines that goes to the to the cryogenic uh, uh, measurement chamber. And then here you have uh, these uh, um, reference standard that will be measured and then combined with the measurements of, uh, com compared with the measurements that we will make on the actual uh, devices. Um, this system uh, needs to be designed and set up in, in, into our new cryostat uh, that is able to reach temperature of about 10 uh, millikelvin. And also we have, of course, to develop the, not only the measurement system, but also the measurement methods and the calibration standards that we will put uh, uh, in the cold uh, chamber, because the one that we use at room temperature cannot be uh, employed at cryogenic temperatures. The first application of these systems system uh, will be the characterization of Josephson traveling wave parametric amplifier that are designed and made here at Ingram, and also quantum power sensors uh, that will be made but, uh, at the Royal Holloway University of London. And this is just uh, an example. We are uh, involved in many, in many um, uh, European projects. Uh, that all works uh, around the quantum technology and employed microwave signals. Uh, so this is just an example of some application. You can see here uh, some pictures of our cryostat in which we will install the, the measurement system. And we also have uh, these uh, fully equipped uh, state-of-the-art uh, uh, microwave lab uh, placed in, in a shielding uh, room uh, with a 
controlled environment in temperature and humidity. And in this, uh, in this uh, lab, we also realize the um, SI traceable standard for microwave measurements, scattering parameters from 9 kilohertz to 110 gigahertz and power from DC to 50 gigahertz. So the PhD student will uh, have access to both this facility, this microwave lab, and also the, the lab with the cryostat. Uh, to work in a framework in the framework of the superquant uh, uh, European project, uh, microwave metrology for superconductive quantum circuits. Uh, you can see here the website of the project. We will work with um, many uh, European uh, high-level institutes, and also we are involved for this specific activity. Uh, in the Dart Wars project uh, funded by uh, Instituto Nazionale di Fisica Nucleare. And uh, in particular, the PhD student will have the opportunity to uh, work together with colleagues from um, University of Milano Bicocca and Trento, Trento Institute for Fundamental and Applied, for Fundamental Physics and Applications. Um, so, okay, to summarize, you can see in this slide, uh, the the title of the of the proposal and the skill that uh, our ideal candidate should have that are microwave design and measurements uh, data acquisition data analysis and uh, the ability to to program in python and some knowledge of in, in cryogenic skill uh, are also appreciated you can see again here um, my email, so feel free to write me if you have any question. And if you don't, if you don't ask this question now, you can you can write me whenever you want. And after me, um, we'll uh, give uh, the presentation Emmanuel Enrico on other topics. But we work we work very close together on these projects. So uh, this system will be also uh, employed in the project that uh, Emmanuel will describe to you so far. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Luca. So please, uh, Emanuele, if you can uh, present your uh, topic. Okay, we can see the screen. Okay, so you should also hear me now. Yeah, yeah, yeah please. Okay, so the topic I would like to present uh, today is related to the quantum radar uh, protocol that essentially implement uh, a quantum illumination protocols that uh, uh, beat the classical limits or is supposed to be the classical limits in uh, employing uh, microwave radiation and essentially um, exploiting their uh, quantum correlation. So um, as already mentioned before uh, by the colleague Marco Genovese, um, quantum radiation and quantum light exploit um, peculiar characteristics of radiation that uh, can be, for example, uh, superposition or entanglement and or, or indistinguishability of photons. And uh, these uh, peculiar characteristics distinguish um, a classical light source uh, between a quantum light source. Of course, a classical light source uh, emits uh, photons, and this is not um, uh, the, the only peculiar characteristics that is needed for a quantum light source to, to beat uh, the classical regime. And it's, it's only by um, entangling photons or um, creating uh, quantum states that um, are um, a superposition of um, single photon states that uh, quantum protocols can beat uh, classical protocols in, in the sense of sensitivity or in the sense of accuracy. And um, some example of this uh, comes in the optical regime. For example, um, Inrim has already um, shown that uh, the emission of uh, entangled radiation states can be used to uh, calibrate single photon detectors. And this uh, effect um, exploit a nonlinear interaction uh, of um, nonlinear media uh, with, a, with a laser radiation and this nonlinear interaction generate um, quantum uh, states as an output of, um, of this nonlinear uh, material and these uh, quantum states can be exploited 
uh, in two arms of a, an optical circuit and that um, travel into different direction and and interacts with uh, different uh, detectors and uh, by the combination of information of um, gather uh, from these different detectors it is it is possible to uh, calibrate independently the, both these two detectors without uh, referring to any other detector at all. This this is uh, the peculiar characteristic of a, a, a rounded single photo uh, calibration scheme, and a, a similar um, approach can be used um, in terms of um, uh, detection. So where a, a, an entangled source of, in, in this case, microwave radiation, uh, can be divided into different paths. One path is called the signal path, and the uh, other uh, the other path is called the idler paths and the signal paths can can be uh, used to um, detect for example object and by uh, measuring the interaction of the signal paths with with uh, some unknown object and uh, by measuring these the signal and um, together with the other path and um, essentially um, recovering um, information um, of correlation of these two, these two uh, different signals, it is possible to um, um, have a boost respect to uh, the classical uh, correlation uh, scheme of up to uh, 6 dB. And this is uh, essentially the, the, the scheme of a, a quantum radar that exploit uh, entanglement, uh, entangled source of radiation and that performs um, um, coherence measurement in uh, of two different um, signals and either essentially photons and um, to do that it, it is pos it is important to um, implement of course entanglement radiation sources but also to implement a measurement scheme that uh, uh, are uh, capable to reach the uh, required um, signal to noise ratio and accuracy and stability in order to uh, effectively uh, reach the target value of 6 dB um, improvement uh, respect to the classical protocol. So in, in terms of the um, realization of entanglement radiation source, we, in, in, we develop and design and fabricate um, parametric amplifiers, uh, traveling wave parametric amplifiers that are, that are um, device, candidate devices for emission of non-classical radiation by means of nonlinear interaction of uh, quantum circuits. And essentially these, uh, these nonlinear interactions come from uh, the parametric uh, nature of the amplifier themselves. And we build this, this uh, solid state thin film based device in, in our campus inside the um, rather new uh, clear room facility that is located in our campus and is called uh, PK, that stands for Piemonte Quantum Enabling Technologies. But, uh, and um, also we, we characterize and we are um, implementing the, the experimental setup for the characterization and measurement of our um, quantum solid state devices um, in, in our campus by, by exploiting uh, these uh, dilution refrigerators that is, uh, as Luca Alberto already mentioned, is uh, capable to reach uh, low temperature up to uh, down to uh, 10 millikelvin and where we mount uh, our um, solid state devices and also all the um, circuitry and and the uh, measurement apparatus that can be exploited to uh, to um, implement quantum uh, measurement protocols and also also this this kind of uh, dilution refrigerator is coupled uh, to room temperature electronics that um, that can be programmed in order to show uh, how these quantum devices uh, behave so the, the proposal here uh, in, in the terms of quantum radar is to uh, boost the uh, room temperature electronics in order to exploit uh, the uh, coupling with a uh, cryogenic uh, apparatus and to show um, quantum correlation of signals coming out from the cryostat itself. So this is uh, one of the example of uh, the scheme where you can see that uh, several components at, at room temperature can be placed and tuned and programmed in order to and show how the signals coming from the cryostat 
uh, have a, a quantum fingerprint in, in, the, in their cells. This is just to show an example of uh, how we build um, quantum circuits and how we connect room temperature electronics with cryogenic temperature electronics. And um, essentially, this is a rather quick um, overview of what the candidate could uh, study during uh, and develop during um, this three year project. And essentially, uh, the candidate will uh, develop experimental models and setups for, um, for demonstrating quantum enhanced detection. And of course, uh, one of the uh, main topic is to compare the, the quantum enhanced detection with uh, classical uh, methods. And uh, of course, all of these activities will be performed in the microwave regime and with, by exploiting cryogenic um, uh, electronics. And this project is running uh, as a collaboration uh, but with um, the University of Camerino and the uh, Consorzio Nazionale Inter Interuniversitario per le Telecomunicazioni and this has been uh, funded by the uh, Defense Ministry of uh, Italy and in particular by Teledif uh, Division. So if you are interested in more details, please contact me. There, is, there you can find my email address and so thank you for the attention. Thank you, Emanuele. Just the idea of this presentation, just to give an overview, then if all of you have some more specific information requ request, you can uh, contact directly the proponent. So, uh, next presentation uh, will be given by Marco Poisson. Marco, are you ready? Yes, I'm here. I hope you hear me. Yeah. And uh, let me see if I manage to share the screen. Uh, here I'm going to present you uh, this uh, PhD activity uh, that uh, uh, focuses on measuring the dynamic magnetic properties of magnetic materials that are uh, produced by 3D printing, so what is more correctly called uh, additive manufacturing. Um, this, this project, this activity will be held uh, in, in our institute, of course, but uh, is part uh, of the activities of a European project uh, that uh, involves uh, other uh, universities and uh, companies also in, uh, uh, in Europe. Um, the context is that uh, of the um, electric transport, uh, uh, electric vehicles, I mean, but not only vehicles, cars, but also soft mobility, for example. So everything that uh, uses an electrical motor to move people or goods around. Uh, you might think that this is not a very new topic as electrical motors exist uh, since uh, a lot of time. Uh, but uh, now that uh, this subject is becoming uh, really, really hot because the electrical mobility is becoming uh, widespread, uh, it's starting to, to um, uh, raise new problems to the industry and also to the material science and to the metrology. Uh, because of course, uh, uh, Anybody can, uh, can build an electrical motor, but uh, once uh, its application is so widespread, uh, it is necessary that uh, we start thinking about uh, uh, the weight, the motor must be lightweight, uh, the price, they must be cheap because they must be anywhere, they must be reliable. And also, since they use uh, power, electrical energy, uh, the material, the magnetic material that makes uh, their core, uh, either the rotor or the stator, uh, must have uh, as uh, little uh, power losses as possible, because their use everywhere will mean that even very small losses, uh, but uh, on uh, millions or billions uh, um, objects everywhere, will add up. Uh, and, and so it is uh, uh, mandatory to try to reduce uh, also the power losses. So uh, the, the picture here shows an example of a, a rotor of an electrical motor that is produced by one of the companies that uh, is part of the project. And that is made by laser melting. So it is one of the uh, additive manufacturing techniques uh, that, uh, that are used. Uh, as you can see, it is a, a relatively small object in this case, uh, but it is a complex object. 
Uh, and uh, this shows you why it is uh, so interesting to build uh, uh, electrical motors in this way, because you don't have to start from sheets of steel or other magnetic materials to cut them, uh, to pile them, to heat them in order to recover the best magnetic properties and so on. With just a single uh, industrial step, you prepare the final object with the desired shape and uh, hopefully the desired magnetic properties properties and characteristics. This hopefully is what uh, uh, brings uh, the uh, scientific activity that is part uh, of, the, uh, of the PhD that uh, we are proposing. Because uh, actually uh, the industry, uh, the metallurgists uh, are nowadays uh, extremely good at making good magnetic materials uh, with the desired microstructure, with the desired properties and with the very small uh, power losses when they are subject to alternating electromagnetic fields that are those that in fact drive um, uh, an electrical motor. The problem is that when you move to uh, a, a complex object uh, like the rotor that I showed you, uh, prepared with a completely different technique, uh, the microstructure is no longer the one that you will would, would hope. Uh, here you can see a micrograph that has been taken in um, one of our labs, showing that uh, the microstructure is full of cracks, of imperfections, and so on. And uh, uh, it is uh, rather well known that all these imperfections besides maybe giving problems of reliability and mechanical uh, toughness of the object, uh, are also extremely, extremely uh, bad at, uh, uh, for, for what concerns the power losses, because uh, they, they hinder the movement of the magnetic domains, uh, domain walls, uh, and so they increase uh, uh, by orders of magnitude sometimes, even uh, the, the, even rather magnitude, the, the power losses. So it is extremely important to uh, be able to characterize a magnetic material prepared in this way uh, in order to uh, know uh, how it performs compared to the classical materials that are produced nowadays. And also in order to be able to uh, reach at least the um, performance that classical materials have, and maybe even better performance. Uh, the problem is that uh, you must have uh, the proper metrological tools to uh, do this kind of characterization. Because nowadays, uh, the magnetic materials are characterized sometimes following certain standards, sometimes following uh, techniques that are not yet standardized, but are rather well known and common. But uh, normally, you characterize the you characterize either a sheet, a rod, uh, powders, uh, a sphere, a cylinder, some 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 object with a specific specific shape, or uh, responding to specific standards. Uh, but none of these shapes uh, or forms uh, the material comes uh, comes with uh, are compatible with the uh, final objects that are prepared with three D printing. So we must figure out new ways to characterize the materials uh, in, uh, uh, when, when they come in uh, complex and finite objects that come out from the 3D printing systems. And this is not obvious at all because I just, I'm just showing you here a very simple example. In the graph here, you can show, you can see that the same material uh, the, his uh, its teresis loop uh, uh, is uh, measured with the same technique. It is the vibrating sample technique. Uh, it doesn't matter for the moment. Uh, it is the same material, but in three different forms. It is uh, the original material. It was it was a rod. Uh, it is powders uh, obtained from the original materials by grinding them, and uh, it is uh, a small piece cut from the rotor that is has been obtained by three D printing. And as you can see, the three hysteresis loops that you obtain are extremely different. So uh, how can you tell what are the properties of the material? The material is the same. Uh, so we, we must find new um, metrological tools to properly define what we are measuring and to properly measure what we would like to measure. Uh, so all of this is at the uh, frontier between material science we must uh, and uh, physics of matter, we must understand what is going on in the material and characterize it. Uh, metrology, the science of measurement, and of course, uh, uh, new uh, industrial applications. So that, that's it for any questions. Uh, I recall you.
my email address and thank you very much. Thank you, Marco. So now we can move to the last presentation. Uh, it will be done by Gianni Durando. Please, Gianni, yes. you can share your I'm screen. Ready. So my name is Gianni Durando. I am head of the um, IRIM ultrasound lab. I would like to present you how our PhD position, ultrasound mediated and neuromodulation and metrologic approach. The proposal is in collaboration with Francesco Neurosurgeon at Instituto Neurologico Carlo Besta and visiting professor at the University of Virginia. It's about brain barrier. BBB represent a major obstacle to the delivery of drugs to the central nervous system. The combined use of uh, drugs um, of, uh, sorry, of low intensity pulsed ultrasound waves and the intravascular microbubbles represent a promising solution to the, this issue, allowing reduction of the barrier. Cranial replacement with the um, high density uh, polymer plate are widely used in neurosurgical procedure to permit acoustic window to, for imaging elements. To provide optimal tailored therapeutic effects to treat a metrological approach is needed to understand the complex biological effect. The project uh, will be partially the, funded by focus and vision. This, the association is based in the United States with a hard link with the European clinics and research centers. Um, the main PhD project objective and outputs are development and characterization uh, of uh, ultrasonic insulation system to be used for in vivo test, measurement of the effects of the application of different uh, ultrasound measures, frequency, on physiological activities at brain level, analysis of, of microbubbles induced BBB opening on brain drug delivery, uh, the state of the heart, acoustic characterization of the ultrasound transparent polyophylin plate has been performed at the IRIM lab uh, using the IRIM hydrophone scanning tank system. Uh, a comparison between uh, uh, measure array pressure and energy with and without plate have been made. No, oh, sorry, no significant difference less than 10% were reported in the scan performed with the prostates compared to the ones without interposition. Uh, we passed through the first in vivo test result. Um, the, the, uh, this is the scheme on the, on the left, this is the scheme of the experimental setup for the microbubble perfusion via the resident arterial system of the in vitro isolated brain. On the right scheme of the sonication setup. And uh, finally, the picture shows a realization of the sonication system. The video, uh, I tried to, okay, start the, the video. The video clearly shows the effect of the BBB opening using a low intensity pulse the ultrasound. The first result has been published in February 2022 on scientific report and report on the IUP physics ward in the section emergency therapy on April 2022. So, which is our uh, proposal regarding scheduling. During the first year, uh, the PhD student will attend the PhD courses at the Polytechnic of Turin, uh, of Torino. And at the same time, at the IRM ultrasound lab, the student will develop and characterize the insulation system used for the in vitro and vivo experiment at the Instituto Neurologico Besta in Milan. The first part of the second year, the student will, will test the insulation system at the anti-lab and the rest of the second year, the student will work at the Virginia Polytechnic Institute and State in Virginia State, uh, USA. During the third year, the student will come back in Italy to finalize and write a PhD thesis. This is all from my side. For further information, please contact me uh, at the email address. Thank you. Thank you, Giovanni. Very precise time schedule. <laughs> uh, okay, uh, so we have uh, 
finished the presentation of the 10 research topics. I guess you have had, you have had a quite large overview of uh, activities that are proposed for this school. If uh, there are some questions, specific questions related to the presentation that we have uh, seen today or more general questions related to the, to the call, please, you can do this, uh, you can pose this question. Uh, in case uh, in the in the next uh, days or weeks, uh, if you have a specific question, you can directly write to the proponent. Uh, or if you have uh, questions related to the call, please uh, you can write to me. I will uh, put my email address in the chat. Uh, so I think that if there are no questions, we can uh, stop the the event here. Okay, I would like to thank all the, the speakers, all the, the colleagues that have presented their proposal. And uh, thank you also to the all people who have uh, attended this event. Please uh, remain in contact with uh, our website uh, or to the website of Politecnico di Torino, in particular the school, uh, doctoral school, for uh, checking information uh, for this session, but also for the next session that would be in September, because uh, probably some other position will be made available. So thank you, everybody. And uh, we can stop here. Thank you very much. Thank Bye. you. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.